Well, I uh, appreciate the invitation from the, from the organizers. It looks like they've done a spectacular job. We had two great talks yesterday. Um, and I'll try to ta tell you about prader willi syndrome today. And so when Jim Kane asked me to, to do this talk, he um, charged me with um, demonstrating to you why prader willi syndrome is such a, an exceptional model to, to understand obesity. And this, um, Jim's interest in starting these hyperphasia conferences really, I think, began back in Baltimore in 2004 when he organized a prader willi syndrome roundtable and then um, several years later organized the, the first hyperphasia conference and now followed up with this second one. So Jim, along with Steve and Phil and others on the organizing committee, have done a great job. So a little introduction. A lot of you know about prader willi syndrome, so I, I won't belabor it. Uh, 1956 it was first described. 1981, uh, David Ledbetter demonstrated that it was localized to the proximal region of the long arm of chromosome 15. And the prevalence is about 1 out of 15,000. Uh, it's the most commonly diagnosed genetic cause of obesity. And PWSA USA is aware of over 5,600 individuals in this country with prader willi syndrome. And the international organization, IPSO, uh, represents 25,000 families in 100 different countries now. So um, there are many groups out there, um, and it's diagnosed quite frequently. So what are the, the major features? Of course, the major feature is the obesity and hyperphasia. But uh, remarkably, these infants start out hypotonic, failure to thrive as uh, neonates. They also have hypogonadism with infertility, small hands, small feet, due to the growth hormone deficiency, and a very characteristic uh, neural behavior that uh, is somewhat obsessive compulsive, mild to moderate intellectual disability, and the genetic cause is due to a lack of expression of paternal genes in the 15Q11, Q13 region. So prader willi syndrome was the first uh, genetic disease associated with the phenomenon of genomic imprinting where parental inheritance um, does make a difference. And in this case, the prader willi individuals are lacking genes expressed only from coming from the dad's chromosome. So this is a, a young infant we diagnosed at a, a very young age, and you can note the bitemporal narrowing. You note the NG tube. Um, the feeding tube, these children need assisted feeding in the first several months of life. Um, they have a poor suck. More than that, they have a very poor appetite. They're not interested in eating. And if they weren't prompted or fed regularly, many of them would just die. Uh, you can also note the hypogonadism, small scrotal sac here, and the very hypotonic frog leg type position. And then, remarkably, at, at around two years of age, the weight starts going up. And you can see this young girl. She's two and a half years of age. You can see where she used to have a G-tube to assist feeding her. Um, of course, now, at this age, she doesn't need any help. And you can see the, the skin-picking sites that she has. And then um, an older individual, insatiable appetite by this age. So um, as I discussed, the, the, the region that's affected is the 15Q11 to Q13 region, and it's present in this chromosome, miss, missing in this ideogram. Now, remarkably, there are two syndromes that can result from uh, a deficiency in this uh, proximal region of chromosome 15, two very different syndromes, the, the prader willi syndrome with the obesity, mild intellectual disability, and Angerman syndrome, which is a lack of maternal contributions. So there are genes only expressed coming from the dad in this region, and then there's two genes only expressed coming from the mom. And Angerman is much different. Um, it's uh, called the happy puppet syndrome. They have no speech, happy affect, severe intellectual disability. 
So it's a significant difference of which parental contribution is um, missing. And I'm not going to belabor the genetics today except to give some orientation. And we know a lot about the region. It's a five to six million base pair region. There's 10 genes um, identified in, in light blue here, which are only expressed coming from the, from the father's contribution. Uh, and typically, this is a new mutation that arises in spermatogenesis. Um, and then there are two genes only expressed from the, the mother's allele. And then the, the genes in light green are equally well expressed from both the uh, maternal and paternal contribution. Um, and so they have biparental expression. And then there's various deletions. Um, the the Prada Willi imprinted region is about two and a half million base pairs, and the Angerman is probably half a million to a million base pairs. So um, Prada Willi syndrome is a contiguous gene syndrome, meaning that it's the loss of function of, of several genes. And what's the function of, of these genes? Well, several people in this audience um, have been working on this, Rob Nichols, Rachel Webrick, uh, Merlin Butler, and, and others. Um, and we, we're starting to know more about the function of, of these genes uh, through human studies and also through mouse models. Recently, three patients that have been published, and at least two patients that haven't been published yet, have had a small deletion in one of these SNOW RNA genes called SNORD116 or HB285. And Stefan Stam's group has done a lot of work with the SNOW RNAs, which seem to be involved um, affecting messenger RNA and alternate splicing. This, um, a, a loss, a small loss of, of this gene gives an individual that's obese and hyperphagic, um, but not in, um, encompassing all the features of Prada Willi syndrome, but certainly it's a major gene for obesity and hyperphagia. So switching gears, that was the little genetics 101. And talk about nutrition now. So traditionally, Prader-Willi syndrome has been thought of as having two phases. One, the first phase is hypotonia, the poor feeding, failure to thrive if not assisted uh, feeding, and the poor appetite. And then phase two, hyperphagia leading to obesity, beginning at about one to six years of age. Uh, typically around two to four years of age. And this shows a growth curve, the length and height, and you can see the weight in this individual. This is someone that I, I diagnosed in, in the first day of life in the neonatal intensive care unit. And you can see uh, there's an NG tube in here. The NG tube comes out below the fifth percentile. And then at around, oh, 18 to 30 months of age, the weight starts going up precipitously. And this is on a recommended daily allowance of calories. We were following this child very carefully. So if you give 100% of RDA in young individuals with Prader Willi syndrome, in that uh, starting at around 15, 18 months of age, they're going to start to become obese. So we really um, have to cut them down to about Jen Miller and I typically put them on somewhere between 50 and 70 percent of recommended daily allowance when their weight starts to cross percentile lines there. And then, uh, if unchecked, the weight continues to rise. Now, one of the nice things is, is that we're starting to make the diagnosis of prader willi syndrome a lot earlier, so we have a better handle on the natural history and anticipatory guidance. So over the last 10 years, Jen Miller and I have been working carefully and thinking about the complexities of the nutritional phase, realizing it's a lot more complex than was described. And we recently uh, published um, our, our work on nutritional phases in that there are, are seven phases and subphases, in, in fact. Starting with phase zero, uh, and this is described in more detail in, in the abstract in your book, but um, Prenatally, these infants have decreased um, fetal movements. When they're born, they're about 15% um, lighter birth weight than their normal control sibs. And we looked at 
uh, birth data from 79 individuals with Prader Willi and 85 of their SIBs. And then after they're born, um, phase 1A, they have the poor appetite, needing the assisted feeding, the hypotonic. And the median age range that we found in our group of 58 patients that we had good history on and good growth records, um, we found with zero to nine months. Some people were in this phase longer, some less. And then um, phase 1B occurs when the infant starts growing along the, the curve, the appetite's improving, assisted feeding is uh, no longer needed. And then phase two then is when the weight starts to go up. And initially, that weight starts going up without any increase in calories, uh, without any change in the appetite, if you had that child on 100% of recommended daily allowance. Uh, and so if we're following these children closely, we start to ratchet it down. But if unchecked, you saw that the weight um, still goes up precipitously. And so that's, that's around two years of age to about four and a half years of age. And then the, the appetite really doesn't um, start increasing till about four and a half years of age in, in our cohort. Again, some earlier, some later. And that lasts till about eight years of age. At about eight years of age becomes the typical phase that we associate with Prader-Willi syndrome. The ravenous appetite, insatiable, um, hoarding food, stealing food, thinking about food all the time. This is the, the classic phase of Prader-Willi syndrome. But in contrast to the, the old dogma that it was hyperphagia leading to obesity, we've noted in our very careful studies that the weight starts to go up before the, the appetite starts to go up. And then, of course, the appetite going up exacerbates it. And then when they get insatiable, that makes it even um, more challenging. And that lasts to adulthood. And most of our adults are in this phase. But very interestingly, we've noted that some of our adults, the appetite changes. We have about 50 individuals in Gainesville that live in the group homes. And so it's a very controlled environment. Um, and the staff is very familiar with Prader-Willi syndrome. The, the food's locked up, special diets. And both parents and um, group home workers note that something ha has changed. The appetite is less. It could still be increased. It could be normal. Or we have some individuals that have a lower than average appetite. We have to start giving more calories to these individuals. And I should note, a typical adult in, in um, phase three with Prader-Willi syndrome is probably on about 1,200 to 1,400 calories per day, which is half of probably what um, most people consume that don't have Prader-Willi syndrome. So much more complex than traditionally thought. And I think that's very important. If we're going to dissect what are the factors, what are the hormonal contributions, then you really have to start with a good history and, and clinical exam. And so for um, over 10 years now, we've been having a natural history study at University of Florida, initially just Jen Miller and myself. And then we became part of the rare disease uh, network in the early uh, 2000s. And um, now we have a, a, a network to study the natural history of Prader-Willi syndrome, which is changing. And that encompasses our site in Gainesville, Florida, um, Vanderbilt. Merlin Butler's group out in Kansas City, and then Virginia Camonis' group at University of California, Irvine. At any rate, in our study, we're, lo we're looking at um, Prader-Willi syndrome, of course, but then there has to be comparison groups. So we have others that we've been seeing in our uh, clinic that don't have Prader-Willi syndrome but have a very compelling early onset morbid obesity before five years of age. Um, and we call these the EMO group, early onset morbid obesity. Um, and they d don't have any discernible reason for their obesity. We're start we're do various genetic studies, MC4R, uh, leptin, chromosomal microarray. Uh, but they, for the most part, these individuals do not have a genetic diagnosis. But they do have, uh, obviously, big problems with weight. And then the normal weight sibling controls from the EMO and the Prader-Willi group. So we're preserving the same environment. We see them every one to two years, the younger ones every year, the older ones every two years. 
and we collect um, various um, parameters, the basal metabolic rate, uh, caloric intake, body fat by DEXA, and various analytes that we're looking at. And so I'm going to uh, talk a bit about um, Graylin as an uh, illustrative case. Um, David Cummings in 2002 published in Nature Medicine that Grayling was elevated in Prader-Willi syndrome in adults. And it's um, pretty dramatic. Here's, here are the Prader-Willi individuals. And then controlling to obese controls, um, lean controls, and then leptin receptor mutations, leptin receptor controls, and MC4R mutants and controls. And you can see that the individuals with um, Prader-Willi syndrome have a four and a half fold increase compared to the obese controls and two and a half compared to the lean controls. And several other groups have found uh, so similar findings um, in the adults. But the, what's going on in children is, is controversial. Um, there are several groups, some of the people which you hear, the, the results haven't been as clear in young children what's going on. Does the um, Graylin elevation, does that uh, occur before the hyperphagia and Prader-Willi syndrome? You know, when does it start and does it correspond with the nutritional phases? So these were, were questions we had using um, both looking at these children by age groups and also by nutritional phase. And so um, we've been able to collect a, a number of samples th through the years and for um, Young individuals less than five years of age, we, we had 69 samples from 20 males and 20 females. So these children come back and see us so we can start to have longitudinal studies. And then we had 38 samples from the sibling controls and 10 from the emo group. Um, the emo group, remember, they have to be, become obese less than five. So we're not making the diagnosis as early in emo because we have to wait for the clinical features. In Prader-Willi syndrome, we're making the diagnosis as neonates at less than two months of age because of the hypotonic floppy um, individuals and there's very robust genetic tests. So we're um, prospectively diagnosing the Prader-Willis, but we have to retrospectively diagnose the EMOs. In the 5 to 12 age group, we had a good number. Of course, we have a lot more EMOs in that group and, and so forth. You get a sense of our samples here. And so what do these emo kids look like? Well, the, this individual has early onset morbid obesity and compare that to a similarly aged 15-month-old with Prader-Willi syndrome. These are pretty dramatic kids that uh, Jen Miller and I are, are seeing. Uh, and you can see this is a, a very large individual. And then here are two six-year-olds. This individual has early onset morbid obesity. This is the one with Prader-Willi syndrome, but you note that the one with emo is 300% of ideal body weight, while the individual with Prader-Willi syndrome is only 200%. So um, in, most in most of these cases, the obesity is more profound in the emo group for, for several reasons, not the least of which is because they don't have a diagnosis. When you get a diagnosis, it comes a, a lot of understanding and, and more support. So we looked at Graylin 0 to 30 years of age, and in the, the circles in red are the Prader-Willi individuals, the light blue are the sibling controls, and the black triangles are the emo group. And you can see we don't have a whole lot of emos in the young age, but then we, we start to pick them up as they get older. And so zero to five, um, you can see there's a wide distribution but that the Prader-Willi group as a whole has um, higher mean gray limb. But the other thing you should note, and um, others have, have demonstrated this as, as well, that there's overlap. There's certainly individuals that are very high with Prader-Willi syndrome, but then you note that there's some that have l low values down there with the control groups in the, in the EMOs. And another thing is you notice the EMOs are initially high and then they drop. And that the values go down as you get older. And this is just zeroing in on zero to five years of age now. And uh, just to, to again to show you that the very interesting fact here 
is, is that some of these individuals with Prader-Willi have, have low ghrelin levels. And so I'm going to show a bunch of box plots rather quickly for the interest of time. So we divided it by age first, and then we divided it by nutritional phase. So if you look at zero to two years of age, you can see clearly there's a difference in the, in the mean ghrelin level um, from these 25 samples versus the 14 samples from the, the sibling controls. And just to refresh people's memories with box plots, the whiskers are at um, the 90th and 10th percentile. The top of the box is 75th percentile. The bottom 25th and the straight line across here is the median. Um, and so you can see the, the Prader Willies are significantly different as a group than the sibling controls, but that there's overlap. Now, in the 2 to 5 and the 5 to 12 year age range, there's, there's been controversy. Some groups have found that there is, is not a difference between the Prader Willies and the controls. Uh, and then other groups like Matei Tober's group has uh, shown that in, in fact the, the Prader Willies are uh, a bit higher. And so what we find here by age is that there is in the mean group a small um, difference between the Prader Willies and the sibling controls. The p value was 0.04. So not dramatic. And then 5 to 12, at the mean was significant at the p value of 0.04 between the Prader Willies and the sibling controls and 0.01 between the emos and the Prader Willies. Not, not very dramatic, not very impressive. Um, when we get to 12 to 20, the differences start to um, get more pronounced. And then 20 to 30 years of age, again, comparing the adult studies by David Cummings groups and, and others initially, you can see that as a, as a group, the Prader Willies are higher than the two other groups. Um, but again, there's, there's overlap. Now, if we do it by nutritional phases, you can see that um, bigger differences be, between the, the groups, but there's still overlap. So if you look at phase 1A, here's the box plot here, um, versus 1B, and then 1B to, to 2A, et cetera. Remember, um, the phase one is where they're not obese. Phase two is where the, the weight starts going up and you start to have obesity. Uh, there's a, the, looking at all these, the only significant difference, though, is going from phase 1B to phase 2A. Again, going from not overweight to the beginnings of the weight going up. Now, if, if we look and say, well, let's just look at the, the Prada Willie individuals that are in, in phase 1A where putting on weight's a problem, not too much weight. And so we combine the ghrelin from uh, individuals with Prader Willi in phase 1A and 1B and compared it to Prader Willi's in phase 2A, 2B, and, and 3. Again, the phases where the weight's up and then the appetite starts to kick in. And then here's our sibling controls. And this is a very significant difference. It's 0.001. And the age range we picked here was 0 to 5. So if you just do it by age, um, you may find yourself in, the, in phase 2 or 3 and have a lower ghrelin versus others at the same age would be still in phase 1A or 1B. Uh, and, and the lesson for us was is that looking at nutritional phases was a better way to define what's going on in prader willi syndrome rather than age because one 3-year-old may still have a poor appetite, and another three-year-old may be ravenous. There's a lot of variability um, in our individuals in terms of onset. So um, Graylin, as, as most of you in the audience know, is more than just involved in appetite regulation. Graylin causes activation of the lipogenic genes in the white adipose tissue that was shown back in 2006. Recently, it was shown that ghrelin-induced adiposity is independent of the orexogenic effects. You can separate those two out. So independently, ghrelin will um, induce adiposity. And ghrelin is elevated in small for gestational infants and may be involved in the process of, of ketchup growth. So um, this is probably what, what's going on. Ghrelin's not is preceding the increased appetite. So it's not responsible for the increased appetite. And I should point out, 
our findings are, um, that I just showed are, are very similar to Matei's Tobert's group in Toulouse, France, um, who had a nice uh, large population to uh, look at. So when we looked at, at body fat in, in Prader-Willi syndrome, you can see the, the body fat is elevated. It's not significantly different from the sibling controls in the zero to two age group. But when we look for weight for length percentile in the Prader-Willis, we found that they, their weight for length was at the 25th percentile as, as a group versus the sibling controls were at the 57th percentile. So you have uh, a non-significant difference in, in body weight, the Prada willies a little bit more, but the Prada willies have a much reduced weight for length, and that's significantly different at the 0.015 level. And so, what did these individuals look like? It, if you look at our young patient here, Parker, um, she looks like she's obese, uh, and she's six months of age at that time, but in fact, her weight for length is at the 50th percentile. But if, when I show this to nutritionists at our institution, they'll say, oh, that child's at the 95th percentile. And her body fat is 37th percentile, uh, whereas a, a sibling control would be half that, about 15 to 17%, at a weight for length of 50th percentile. And so uh, Jen Miller and I put uh, young Parker on, a, on somewhat of a restricted diet, dropped the calories below the recommended daily allowance. And by three years of age, her BMI Z-score was uh, a minus 0.9, and her body fat was 18%. So the point is, is the individuals with Prada willi are putting down more fat for the same weight for length or the same BMI Z-score and less muscle mass. Uh, when we looked at leptin, zero to two years of age, it wasn't a significant difference between the controls and, and the Prada willies um, but the Prada willies were a little bit higher. When we looked at leptin then using the nutritional phases, you can see in phase 1A, it's, it's fairly low, 1B starts to go up in 2A, and then 2B in phase 3, the, the leptin is, is, is really going up. Uh, and, and most of the audience knows that um, individuals with Prada willie have uh, less muscle mass and hence more body fat. Um, and, and so that's what we think the leptin's doing. That elevated leptin's not driving the appetite, but is um, driving the adiposity. So um, to summarize, the nutritional phases in Prada Willi are much more complex than traditionally described, the old two phases, hyperphagia leading to obesity. It's a gradual progression. These individuals, it, it's... We, Jen Miller and I have taken history after history. These, these children don't have an appetite. They don't get excited. They don't cry for food. Uh, they're hypotonic, sure, and they have a poor suck, but that doesn't mean you can't be hungry. They, they just show no interest. And the, the great thing about our study is we bring in families with sibling controls, so these, these parents aren't rookies. They've had kids before. They know, they know what's going on, and we ask, well, how is you know, Parker compared to little Johnny or little Emma? and we get these, these great histories. So the, there's an appetite progression that's gradual from no appetite to insatiable appetite. The obesity um, begins before the appetite is increased if you're not watching calories. Now, we've changed the natural history um, uh, of many individuals with prader willi syndrome by diagnosing them at two weeks of age and starting to counsel up the parents and the grandparents that, okay, you know, failure to thrive now, no appetite, but trust me, this weight's going to go up and then the appetite's going up, so you need to institute good behavior modification now, um, good uh, system of, of feeding. Um, the hypergrelinemia, as I showed, precedes the hyperphagia and obesity, and as I said, those are the same findings Matei Tobert found in her group. And then, very interestingly, and we don't have a great handle on this, but we know what happens. Some of our um, adults have a distinct improvement in their appetite control. And again, that makes it very compelling to understand what's going on with those individuals. So, you know, our premise is that a better understanding of the various nutritional phases of Prader Willi will help in the treatment and management of individuals with Prader Willi syndrome but it'll give us invaluable appetite, uh, insights into obesity and appetite regulation in general. 
So Jim Kane said, you know, I, I want you to convince the audience that Powder Willie is a great model to better understand obesity and hyperphagia. To, so to sum things up, I'll, I'll list these bullet points. We have a, a large number of genetically proven patients that are very eager to, to participate in research. Um, people fly from all over into our institution. Um, and We don't pay anybody, and we don't pay their flights, but they come in, they get valuable information. They're interested in pushing things further. There's a good candidate major gene. There's other genes that we're learning a, a lot about. Rachel Reverick's doing a lot of good work on mouse models. So there's genes out there that we're getting a good understanding on. Um, and the beauty is that we're diagnosing Prader Willis syndrome before the obesity sets in, before the appetite increases. So these are prospective studies, whereas our emo group, um, we don't have many emos zero to two because we don't diagnose them until they become obese and come to our attention. Uh, there are well-described nutritional phases, and then there are highly motivated probably support groups and parents, uh, you know, as uh, well demonstrated by Jim Kane earlier today. Um, so uh, well, obviously, I didn't do this work by myself. Um, they, we, had, uh, we have a great group of uh, colleagues at the University of Florida. And my uh, close colleague, Jen Miller, um, deserves special uh, mention. Um, she, she and I have worked together for 10 years, and it's great because she provides the endocrine perspective, and I provide the genetics perspective, and then we teach each other about our respective fields. So I know more endocrine now. Uh, Tony Goldstone was a fellow in the lab. He really helped us get these assays uh, going, and he had a great system of um, dividing up the samples that were using those samples all the time. Um, several others, Fred Quay, uh, the graduate student that did the Grayling work, Carlos uh, Solsano is my lab manager, did the leptin. Christine Keeling is our study coordinator, and uh, she's the one that cracks the whip on all of us in the study. Um, other great people funding, and especially I want to thank the Prada Willie and, and Emo families for their support, and not just bringing the, the affected individual into our study, but the uh, siblings as well, and, and the parents themselves. So uh, with that, um, I'll wrap it up and entertain questions if there's time. I don't know how much time I left. We have about five minutes for questions.